couple of pretty beefy servers, 150 bucks a month. It's not all that cheap, but it's th that was a good way to, to still do my own stuff, uh, mostly before any of the cloud thing, of that cloud, the whole cloud thing was really a thing. Um, but um, what did I really want out of it? So um, in a nutshell, I wanted a pretty simple platform that can host containers or virtual machines um, for you know, whatever I want, really. It needed to be very easy to create additional instances, very easy to set up networking and storage. And I also wanted the ability to easily delegate access and resources to friends, family, other nonprofits, that kind of stuff, um, so that I could use the extra resources I had to share with others. And I also want this to have as few moving parts as possible, because I don't like fixing things. And when you've got 50 different pieces of software all combined together, there's a tendency for one of them to go wrong reasonably often, um, especially when you apply all your updates all the time to make sure nothing is bad from a security standpoint, eventually something will break. So having fewer pieces meant that I was able to get more knowledge on those few pieces, really understand them, and if something does break, actually had a clue as to go, how to go about fixing it. Um, I effectively wanted the ability to tolerate the loss of an entire system. Um, that was something that was getting a bit problematic with all of those dedicated hosting providers. Uh, they were they're pretty good at coming to like replace a disk if one fails, but you know the data that's on it is gone. Um, and if a server itself, its motherboard gets fried or something, it can take a while for it to come back online. Can, and you may not get the same hardware back online. And with those, like having a spare machine, also the, the price really um, increases quite a lot because each of those are meant to be really completely independent with their own internet access and their own everything. So yeah, I wanted something that could tolerate the loss of the entire system should it happen, and with a clear path for recovery, not like just a theoretically, we can lose the system and we'll be fine, but a, I want this to kind of be stress tested every single week so that when that happens, I, I know how it works and it will be fine. And kind of related to that, I wanted the regular maintenance to be very easy to perform and with, you know, without any fear of breakages. Um, running my own servers for a long, long time, I remember the days where you know, people were, were looking at the uptime and be like, look at my server, it hasn't been rebooted in a year, that's great. Well, it's not so great, really. It also means you haven't done security updates in a year. And that usually means you're also absolutely terrified of rebooting that machine because you've not run it in a year. Like, do you, if, will the machine even come back on the network? Like, what do you do? Like, do you need to actually, you know, call your data center or call someone to go and like hook up a KVM on it and figure out what the hell's going on? Um, it's, it's a bit of a, bit of a problem. So, um, why not just use the cloud? Well, that's the first reason, really. Um, the cloud is not cheap. It really isn't. It is cheap for some stuff. The cloud really started as a way to cheaply handle temporary additional load. Um, so if you're running your infrastructure and you need to deal with, um, I don't know, Black Friday sale, or you need to deal with I don't know, Christmas holidays or something like that, it's great because it gets your additional capacity pretty much instantly that you can get rid of as soon as you no longer need it. And it's amazing for that. Um, but keeping things running year long with reasonably large instances in the cloud can be pretty darn expensive, especially because the, the clouds have a, a tendency to, to charge you for things that you're not really used to being charged for usually, things like network consumption, storage, backups, those kind of things. And the, it's usually priced in a way that makes it very uh, tempting to use the service, but then very expensive to, like, it's very easy to back up your data, it's gonna be cheap. But actually restoring it or moving it elsewhere is going to be quite pricey. Um, so th there's a bunch of that that's a, th that can make things quite expensive. Um, the cloud definitely has its uses. It's great if you need to, to run your application in a very dis like, geographically distributed way, if you need small instances everywhere, amazing for that. If you need to deal with temporary load, temporary spike in usage, amazing for that. If you're looking at like renting three fixed beefy instances year long for the next decade, maybe not so, so amazing for that. The other thing is that the cloud got extremely complex. Um, this is an easy reference chart from Google Cloud. I'm not sure I really agree on the easy part. Um, it definitely is a reference sheet. Um, but uh, yeah, this is, this is not simple. 
Um, I mean, the vast majority of those services you can usually ignore for, for most day-to-day -day things. I mean, you, you're just going to need kind of your compute storage network, and you're mostly done. Um, but that might not be the best way to kind of optimize cost. Often the best way to optimize cost is to actually make use of a lot of those services, which means you need to learn about a lot of things. And by the time you've learned about a lot of things about your cloud provider, now you're going to notice you're extremely vendor locked in. Um, it's going to be extremely difficult to move to another one because they're going to have a sheet as confusing, if not worse, than this one. But not quite the same way and not quite the same APIs, and moving cloud to cloud gets pretty tricky. So if you want to avoid the lock-in, then you need to do everything yourself in the cloud, which, again, gets very expensive. Uh, there's also the slight issue that cloud platforms are generally not open source. Uh, they can change things on the, under you, and if you don't like it, well, go elsewhere. There's no way for you to go and fix things. There's no way for you to, to contribute any additional features or to do any of that kind of stuff. So um, how to build your own thing, pretty much. That's the technology stack I went with. Uh, I mean, I'm slightly biased on the third one, for sure, um, because that's my own project. But uh, effectively, I was looking for a, a way to have redundant distributed storage network compute at a pretty small scale that can run on pretty cheap hardware. Um, I mean, I've tested it on Raspberry Pis for like the lower end of that. Uh, obviously, what I'm running in data center is a bit fancier than that. but. It can be pretty cheap, and you can try it very cheaply for yourself. Um, all of those are open source. They're all available in a variety of Linux distributions. They're all stable. They all have frequent releases. They all have LTS releases. And they're also pretty good at like, not overstepping on each other. Uh, Ceph is, yeah, it's got a lot of features. It's quite complex, but it's all storage. That's all it does, and it does it pretty well. Oven is just networking. It, it also has a lot of features, as you would expect from a modern SDN type solution, but it's like it, it's not trying to get into doing storage stuff or doing dealing directly with containers or instances or that kind of thing. It's doing just network. And similarly, LexD is primarily doing instances, containers, and virtual machines. It does clustering, it does those kind of bits for redundancy, but it's yeah, it, it does its own thing. It's not trying to really step on everything else either. So kind of going through all three bits with a tiny bit more details. Uh, for those who are not aware, Ceph is, I guess, kind of the de facto solution now for distributed storage. It provides uh, block, file system, and object storage, supports things like snapshot replications. It does, yeah, it, it's got some fancy um, background tasks and management services. It's got uh, observability built in. It's got a lot of features that you, you want to run your storage and figure out you know, what's going on, set different classes on storage, because you might have a mix of hard drives and SSDs and NVMEs and want things to be, to be split whichever way you want. You can control the exact replication you want. It's reasonably modular by design, so the, the control plane bits are completely separate from the daemons that manage the drives themselves. And it's highly available. It uses Paxos as a distributed database for, for that in, because it's a um, modern distributed database. It requires three systems minimal for HA uh, of the control plane. It's open source, released under the DLGPL, and it's supported with major releases every two years. Uh, that gets, I believe, up to five years of support. It's effectively LTS releases every two years with frequent bug fix releases. On the oven side is a pretty modern SDN. Uh, this one has a lot more alternatives these days, um, especially if you look at kind of the SDN solutions for things like Kubernetes. There are a lot more players there. The benefit of oven is that it's, first of all, it's based on open vSwitch and on, so on, on existing kernel modules in the mainline kernel. You don't need to add additional vendor kernel modules and that kind of stuff. It's not dependent on any kind of hardware infrastructure. Um, it's all upstream. It supports hardware acceleration. So you can have it use a very fancy Mellanox Nix, for example, well, NVIDIA these days, um, and do the, uh, the offloading of all of the flow rules onto, onto, this, onto those Nix which then lets you do like 100 gigabit instance to instance type traffic. And we measure that with like the, not quite then 100, but you know, 92 gigabit or something was good enough. Uh, it supports kind of the basics you'd expect. It does distributed switches, routers, load balancers. It supports um, access control lists, DNS. And all of that is effectively done by generating flow rules that are then distributed to all the systems participating. So in, there's no, like if you've, Whichever is supposed to be kind of the active router is only the active router for ingress traffic. Traffic that goes instance to instance just goes directly through tunnels between the machines. 
uh, making it extremely, extremely fast and using very few resources. It's highly available. It uses a rough database for its uh, configuration, so it requires three systems as well. It's Apache 2 licensed. It's got stable releases every three months. They do LTS every two years. So another nice and stable project we can rely on. And then on the Linux D side, as I said, it's slightly biased because it's my own project, but um, it provides system containers and virtual, machine man and virtual machines. Uh, it's got a REST API that makes it easy to drive remotely. It supports clustering, similar to, to Oven. It uses a Raft database with three systems minimum, uh, minimal for HA. It integrates natively with both Ceph and Oven, so that works nicely. And it's image-based. It's got images for a whack ton of distros at this point. I think we, build, we generate something like 375 images daily. Um, so pretty much any distro you can think of, we've got images for uh, on all architectures. And we build both uh, virtual machine, container images, uh, some with CloudNet built in, some without. Uh, effectively, we've got images for everything that you might want. Its, it's clustering is very nice and easy to use, um, which I'm going to be demoing next. And it's Apache 2 licensed, monthly releases, LTS releases every two years that we support for five years. So very similar to the other two as far as upstream stability and compatibility there. So just quick demo break here. I'm gonna show um, how to set up a three nodes XD cluster, because that's nice and easy, so I might as well show it. So I've got three Raspberry Pis here, RPi1, RPi2, RPi3, and I'm gonna be running XD in it on the first one which then will prompt you for a few different things. The first question uh, being whether you want clustering. There we go, clustering, yes. Picks up its IP address, that's fine. We're not joining an existing cluster, creating one. Host name, we'll just pick the local host name, it's fine. Don't need to set up any kind of password authentication. Uh, that's actually a weak, um, a weak point. If you turn on this password authentication, it's less safe than the token-based thing that's enabled by default, so don't do that. Uh, storage, we can use, in this case, uh, ZFS. Uh, it's the default there, but we can do BRFS, LVM, or indeed Ceph, as I mentioned. So no remote storage right now, because I don't have time to demo Ceph right this moment. And it's going to create a small overlay for us, uh, not using Oven, just using the Ubuntu fan, because, um, again, Oven takes a tiny bit of more resources to set up. And that's the first one done. Now, what we can do is let's see cluster add r pi 2 That gets us a token, which is going to be fun to copy paste because of my screen session, but that's my fault. So I'm going to run let's see, init on both of the others already because it takes a tiny bit of time to generate its certificate. And once that's done, we'll just say yes again to clustering, but this time joining an existing cluster. So do that, joining this in cluster, yes. And it's asking for the token now. So I just need to copy paste this thing. As I said, I sadly need to copy paste it in two chunks because my screen is a bit weirdly set up here. There we go. Okay. And it tells me that if there's any data on this next day, it's gonna be wiped because it's joining the cluster. Um, I can override some storage settings. I'm not doing that. And few seconds, and this one is joined. Now, rinse and repeat for the last one. So joining a cluster. Do I have a junk token? Not yet, but I'm about to. There we go. So let's copy that join token. The token effectively includes a unique secret for joining, but also includes the uh, certificate fingerprint and IP addresses of the existing nodes in the cluster. So you don't even need to say what you're joining. The token effectively includes all that data already. So same thing, answer the questions, and we'll be done. So if I do cluster list, you can see that this particular LXT has now three active machines. The database is running on all three of them. The leader for the database is currently the first one. And if we just want to launch an instance, let's use Alpine, mostly because of size. It's super tiny, so less than what to do. There we go. And we have ourselves, in a few seconds, an instance with an IP address. There we go. We can go in there. And I'm uh, ping Google. And that works. So um, going back here, that's just setting up a sim very simple XD cluster, three machines, HA, works. Um, pretty easy user experience. But uh, that's not what I'd 
what I'm running in production. So uh, let's look at what I ended up with. So that's in my color rack in Montreal. Um, that's three machines. I bought them off eBay for, I think it was four grand total, but that's, the machines themselves were much cheaper than that. The machines in total were probably two grand thereabout. The rest was because I bought new storage. I don't want to buy storage off eBay. It's a bunch of disks and SSDs and stuff, uh, but new. Each are uh, perfectly identical systems. Uh, they are dual Xeons, eight, uh, eight core, 16 threads each. They run 64 gigs of RAM each, 10 terabytes of um, hard drive, 2.5 terabytes of SSDs, that being a mix of SATA and NVMe. They've got 10 gigabit networking. Uh, that part is pretty useful for, for Ceph. If you're going to run that in production, having decent networking is quite useful. Otherwise, you're going to be bottlenecking your network pretty quick. And yeah, the hosting fees are pretty cheap in Montreal. Um, with the 50 terabytes of bandwidth I've got, it's right around 250 US dollars for that, which considering I was paying $150 per server in rental before, if you can keep those machines around for a while, it actually ends up being pretty worth it. Plus you get to do things you can't do with uh, dedicated servers or in some cases even with the cloud. Like in this case, each of the machine actually has a 20 gigabit connection to the other being directly patched into each other. You don't get that when you just get like random cloud instances or rent rented server. They they're gonna be very independent. And I mean, I went slightly crazier because I'm, I'm a bit of a networking geek. So I also got my own um, ES number and IPv4, IPv6 public allocation. And I've got direct access to the internal, uh, to the uh, internet exchange in Montreal uh, over a separate dedicated 10 gigabit link. So I've got pretty crazy connectivity. It's all nice and fun. And it's, it's still at a budget that I can consider that to be a hobby, um, which is pretty nice. But again, that's kind of the overkill thing. At home, you could do it on a, Raspberry, on a set of Raspberry Pis and it should be way cheaper. Now, at home, I've got also a crazy setup because, yeah. Uh, those, I don't actually have a cost for the machines because it's pretty much all recycled stuff, like old machines from work, old machines that friends gave me, some random stuff I bought here and there for extra memory and storage and things. So I effectively end up with seven machines in that cluster. Uh, a whole bunch of them are ARM servers, actually. So four of them are um, APM, Xgene type servers. The, that's the first to use there because they're actually super micro chassis that can take two uh, servers per U, which is kind of convenient for density. Uh, then I've got a bigger super micro Intel server. That one, we run a whole bunch of VMs and CI and stuff for the Lexi project on, so it's got 640 gigabytes of RAM. So that one is pretty darn beefy. Um, and then I've got a, another prototype ARM server. I can't actually tell you who the vendor is because I'm not allowed. Uh, that's got 48 cores, 64 gigs of RAM. And then my seventh server is actually like a tiny Libre computer ARM board that's got just four cores and two gigs of RAM. And it's in the same cluster. That's perfectly fine. And that gets me actually a, a cluster that's able to run containers, virtual machines on Intel 32-64-bit, ARM 32-64-bit. And yeah, has a lot of, lot of resources, very flexible. Storage-wise, I effectively picked up everything I had in my basement and just dumped it all into those machines. So at this point, I've got 48 terabytes of uh, hard drives, 3.5 terabytes of assorted NVMEs kind of across all those machines, and 18 terabytes of SATA SSDs. Most of them are right about to die because they're very old drives that I just picked up from elsewhere and are throwing a whole bunch of smart errors and stuff, but until they, they're dead, I might as well use them. And it's all on like 10 gigabit networking. And I've got a UPS because power cuts are a thing. But yeah, that's effectively my home setup, which again, a bit crazy, but that's mostly recycled stuff that was laying around. So instead of having all of those machines be completely separate and you know having to connect into them and kind of forget about what they do and all that kind of stuff, well, at least they're all in one nice cluster that I can talk to and get whatever I want out of them. So it's nice and convenient. So um, how do you build your own? That's where things start to get slightly tricky. Um, the hard way is deploy a Ceph cluster, which sounds maybe easy for some, I don't know, um, but it's not quite that easy. A lot of those projects do have good instructions. Ceph has a few different ways to be deployed. Uh, the recommended way, this way th these days is effectively using, um, using some Docker containers, which is not a great fit if you're gonna be running LexD on those machines as well, because they're gonna be stepping on each other's feet. You don't really want that. Uh, another option, 
which were the other options. Well, so there's Ceph and Sable, which works pretty well. It's actually what I ended up using for some of those. And uh, otherwise, there's Ceph Deploy, which is effectively deprecated, but still works really well. And all it needs is SSH, and it just goes and do things. Then Oven, not quite as nice to deploy, unfortunately. They've got some documentation, but it's pretty sparse. It's mostly kind of OpenStack specific. It's, it's not amazing. Um, it's not very difficult to do, but there's no nice automation for it, which is slightly annoying. The LexD side, I mean, I showed you how to do it just a few minutes ago. That part that it is pretty trivial. Um, so you can do that, and once you've got LexD, you can connect it to Ceph and Oven and enjoy your new personal cloud. Uh, as part of the dual pandemic thing, I've been recording a lot of YouTube videos on, on the LexD channel on YouTube, and that includes actually how to set up Ceph and Oven by hand. So you've got effectively step-by-step -step instructions there if you want to go down that way. It's it can certainly be simplified by things like Ansible playbooks, as I said. Um, there are some for, for Ceph that work really well. I believe I've seen some for Oven that didn't work so well, but they exist. Um, it's not super amazing because it's not as nicely reproducible as you might want for, for a session like that. In my case, I'm using uh, a cluster like this personally. I, I assembled it once for data center. It's fine. But if you're thinking about, you know, if you're a telco or if you're like a retail store or something like that, and you really are dealing with thousands to tens of thousands of kind of edge type locations, and you want to have that small cluster that can, you can show work out at, at each of those locations, it's not, it's not so great uh, to set up by hand. But as it turns out, we're trying to improve that. So um, one thing we've been working on, which isn't quite what we want yet for, for those kind of solutions, but is a good step in the right direction and a good step for people to experiment with, is uh, using canonicals on Juju, uh, which is effectively a, I guess I could define it as like a bit of a cross between an Ansible and Terraform to an extent. Uh, it is, like it's far more than a configuration manager, it is a deployment tool that can take uh, a list of services that you want to deploy, in this case, of an Ceph, LexD and can do the deployment for you against a variety of different substracts. Um, in this case, I'm using LexD virtual machines because I'm me. Um, but you could use the public cloud, you could use uh, bare metal machines, you can use those kind of things. It's, it works pretty well. Um, you can show that bundle, it does a deployment, you wait 10 minutes and you've got something that works, which is really nice for testing. It's, it does have the slight issue that it is not currently capable of doing a proper HA on three machines type thing. It needs more machine than that, which is problematic if you're really looking for the, that tiny, tiny footprint. But if you want to try a solution like this in a nice and easy way, you can use that, and then you can redo it by hand or using Ansible or using something like that on fewer machines. Which brings me to actually showing that Juju thing. So um, if I switch over to this machine, um, that's my desktop back home, and if I do juju status, uh, let's do color, and go and oops, go and look at what that showed. So it shows at the top uh, the list of applications being deployed. So we can see it's deployed uh, Cephmon, which is the Ceph API, effectively Ceph monitors, uh, Ceph OSDs, that's the Ceph disks. Um, it's deployed LexD. And it's deployed the Oven Central, which are the Oven Control Plane, and Oven Dedicated Chassis, which are the, that's the bit that needs to go on every one of the machines. It's also deployed some more addi some additional bits. Um, we've got integration with Confuse and Grafana for LexD, so it deployed that so that you can get uh, nice observability of the workloads you're running. It's also deployed um, a HashiCorp Vault to store the keys needed for Oven, in this case. That's not strictly needed when you deploy things by hand. You can totally just generate your own PKI on the side and put it in place. That tends to be way easier than running something like Vault just not. But Juju can do it and just did in this case. Then we can see the status of all of the different things being deployed. This is currently deployed against, I believe, seven systems. One is used to co-locate kind of all of the infrastructure type services. So it runs uh, Prometheus, Vault, Postgres, all of those bits there. Then I've got one that I'm running dedicated for Grafana just to have an externally, an externally reachable IP address on it. And then I've got five that are running uh, LexD, Ceph OSD, so the Ceph disks, and um, Oven. You can see here that 
like, so the bottom is the, the list of the machines that are currently being used. And we can see um, the slash LexD shows that for that machine that's running all the services, Juju effectively creates LexD containers on there to place the different services still isolated from each other, which is nice and convenient. Now, this is effectively a functional cluster. If I do Juju SSH in one of the machines, to user, yeah. And I go on there, and then I go look at let's see cluster list. We'll see that. Um, oh, I picked the wrong machine. Uh, uh, let me pick a machine that's actually running some. It's actually part of the cluster. This one should be. Okay. Cluster list. Okay. So we said Juju deployed those machines and set up the cluster for you, and all of that is in place. Now. Even though it deployed Ceph and Oven and put all the credentials and things in place, LexD has not been configured to use that yet. So if we look at the storage, for example, we only have local storage set up right now. And for network, we've got a um, LexD fan bridge that's set up for a much simpler overlay, but it's not yet integrated with Oven. So um, the first thing I'll do is show what was actually deployed. So that's that YAML file here. Um, each of my systems has a dev SDB, that's the disk that I want to put inside Ceph, so that's what's configured at the top. Um, we also configure, uh, well, tell you to have many Ceph monitors, so the, the API servers are gonna be running, three in this case, and how many total disks to expect, in this case it's five. And then there's a list of machines, you can put some restrictions for like their size and stuff there, uh, which didn't apply here, because I used pre-existing systems. And then the list of applications. This particular, uh, it's called a Juju bundle that's actually included in the documentation for the LexD charm, so you can easily find it, um, find it online. And then it includes all different services, and at the end it includes um, a list of all the connections between all different services so that Juju can integrate everything nicely. But as I said, now we've got Ceph in place, Oven in place, LexD in place, but it's not actually integrated with LexD yet. So I've got another script I wrote, which is the post deployment. And the first thing that this thing does is it exposes both Grafana and NextD to the public internet, so I can easily reach that from my laptop. Then it connects to LexD itself, so it, it uses a Juju action to go and trust my client, so it just adds that into the trust store for LexD, and then starts using it. Once it's done that, it tells uh, Ceph, again, through Juju, to create a new Ceph pool, and adds that Ceph pool to LexD. Once it's done that, then it does the network side of things where it creates an uplink network. I've got a dedicated um, NIC for internal traffic on each of those VMs. So it's using that. It sets it up with a, the uplink network. Then it creates a bunch of other networks. So those are effectively properly distributed overlay networks. And lastly, it spawns a whole bunch of instances on that so that we can make sure that everything works nicely. So let's run that script and see if it actually works. So the first thing it does is yeah, create its certificate, insert it into the trust store for the, for the cluster, and then connect to it. Once it's done that now, it's talking to Ceph to create that storage pool, adds it to all of the, the cluster nodes, and we can see it shows now that a remote storage pool has been created with nothing using it. Then it created the uplink network for Oven, so that's, the, that's the, your external network, that's the subnet that Oven can get public IP addresses from for external connectivity and then created the other networks, which you can see now. It's default, demo one, demo two, demo three. And then it goes on to create instances. So it created the Alpine instances pretty quickly for the local ones. And now for remote, it had to create Ceph block, um, block devices, unpack the image in there, create instances from there. And that's doing an Ubuntu image as well. So it's downloading the image, unpacking it again, uh, I think in this case, into the local storage. And now it's going to unpack it again into Ceph. And then we should be done as far as creating instances. It's going to get us the Grafana password at the end so that we can go look at that. But yeah, then we'll be up and running with a bunch of instances. I realized that this is, I mean, this is a step towards something that's nice and convenient and user friendly. It is not quite what we want to, our final solution to be. We do have something better coming up but this works. And so now we're done, and if I switch my client over to that remote, which I believe, oh, it's called demo, I think, yeah. So if I do LX list, 
I should be talking to it. I believe it's called demo. I'm hoping it's called demo. So I have to look at the script again to see what I actually did call it. This is taking way too long, it's probably wrong. Um, so let me go look at remote add. Oh yes, okay, the, rem the remote is actually called Juju cluster, so that wasn't gonna work. Switch to the right thing, and there we go. All right, so now we've got those three Alpine instances here. Um, the, well, the first three are on local storage, the next three are stored on Ceph, and then you've got um, Ubuntu, local instances, remote instances, and if we go look at our cluster, see we've got five machines. The first, um, the first is, well, they're all in a, in a database, but the first is the leader, the two are standbys, and the remaining two are, don't even get to vote, they effectively get a stream of the database events, and should one of the other go down, they can quickly be promoted to a standby or the leader. And that all works completely automatically. Now, Let's wreck a bit of havoc. So say I want to do some maintenance on the first server. I can do Lexi cluster evacuate on server one, say yes. And what Lexi is gonna do now is for the instances with local storage, it needs to stop them, move their storage across, start them back up on something else. For instances with remote storage, it doesn't need to do the old moving things across because it just needs to start it back up somewhere else. So now we've done that, if we go look at list and we ask it to filter for everything that's on SRV1, there's nothing. Um, now you could do your maintenance and once you're done, you just do restore SRV1. And it will, again, stop the instances wherever they ended up, move them back where they're supposed to be, start them back up. And that's what's going on there. Um, when using, in this case I'm just using containers because it's faster. But if you're using virtual machines, you can actually do live migration as well uh, in this case so that you don't actually stop the, the workload. And there we are, uh, they're back on SRV01. Now, I don't know, let's see what we've got in SRV02. Okay, only local, so that's not good. SRV03 has a remote one, so that's good. Now, SRV03 is 1048, 79, 68. Uh, if I put the dot here for there, there you go. So let's cause that machine to die. Just hoping it dies quickly, otherwise I'm gonna have to kill it harder. Okay, fine, let's just kill it harder. It was zero three, I think. Oh, right. Uh, Oh, it's stop. Okay, cool. So this one is gone now, um, which means that if we look at our instances on SRV03, well, it's gonna have a bad time. It's in error state because, well, that machine is gone, but the instance was not moved somewhere else. So that's what would happen if that machine was to lose power. But because that instance is stored on Ceph, we can just do move target SRV02 and start it back up. So it was just being moved, started back up somewhere else, didn't lose any data, it was stored on Ceph, we're all good. Uh, its network is open, so it's gonna come back with the exact same IP address, and we're good. That's effectively what would happen if a machine was to actually fail. Um, we don't have support for like automatically moving things when it happens. We could do it, we didn't want to, because you always have the issue of like, is that machine properly dead or just mostly dead? And if it comes back, then what happens if you've got that disk open in two different places that can cause corruption? So we're trying not to automatically do it, but it's very easy to detect when a machine is dead and it's very easy to recover from it. And as I said, we do have a Grafana dashboard as well. So let me go ahead and switch to this one. And I believe it's here. Let's refresh this thing. There we go. So that's the Grafana dashboard that's automatically set up. Um, by, by LexD when, uh, when connected to Grafana. And in this case, it shows you the top usage for memory, for disk, and for a bunch of other things. Um, the slight issue I've got is that none of those instances are using any CPU right now. So there's actually nothing in that graph. If they were using CPU, then they would actually show up. All right, whoops, okay, that's special. Uh, let me fix that. Not sure why it exited the presenter mode when I did that. That's okay. Moving that back and going here. There we go. 
And all right. So what's next? Well, as I said, uh, as you probably also could figure out from the way I was speaking, I even thought, so the manual approach works, but it's a bit of a pain to do. The Juju approach also works, but it's currently not ideal for an actual self-contained stream machine type thing. What we're working on now is on making both Ceph and Oven as easy to cluster together as what I showed you with LexD. So with the same kind of idea of you bootstrap on one, you join the others, the roles just dynamically arrange, and you've got an H3 cluster. Um, we're gonna do that on both Ceph and on Oven, and we're coming up with then effectively an appliance type image that includes LexD, Ceph, and Oven all done that way, all tied together so that you can boot one, like the idea is that you would get five of those systems, either pre-imaged somewhere or you just image them yourselves. You plug them all in a switch, you start them back up, you get a shell on the first one. And it, you do a bootstrap there and then it can find all of the others in the network. You just say, yeah, those machines are the right ones that matches my serial numbers or whatever we show, adopt them all. And you end up with Ceph, Oven, LexD, all deployed, clustered together, and you're ready to go. You can show virtual machines, containers added. That's work we've got in progress. As I said, we've done it with LexD before. That's what I showed you in the, the earlier demo. Uh, we're very close to having it done for Ceph now, and actually have well, submitted another talk at the Open Source Summit in Europe. If that gets approved, I will show you the Ceph thing there. And we should have the, fa the, the dual solution sorted, we believe, by the end of this year, which we're really, really excited about. Because whether you want to run this at home on a few Raspberry Pi, or you want to run this you know, in a data center with a, in a colocation facility like I'm doing, or you are a telco wanting to run this in like hundreds of thousands of small locations all across the country, or your retail store that wants to run that in your back office to run the point of sale, surveillance, whatever, it's gonna be a very, very good solution for that. It's gonna be extremely reproducible. Uh, there's no gonna be like random packages being installed and stuff, it's like three effectively read-only images for each of the bits that they just get installed, it's stateless effectively. Everything is uh, highly available, all three of the main components are. You can lose one of those systems and all you really need to do is, okay, fine, reshuffle my stuff and then drop ship a replacement, have someone plug it, you're done. And that's pretty much, pretty much the, the end game there. Um, that's, it for, that's it for this talk. If you do have any, any questions, I'm gonna be around, but also don't want to stand in your, in your way um, because it's the lunch break coming up. So feel free to, to reach me out on those, any of those um, um, contact details down there. I also have put links to each of the different projects there, as well as uh, things like our YouTube channel that has the videos on how to assemble this stuff yourself should you want to do that. Thank you very much.